um, if, if I may. So um, it's my pleasure again to introduce Mr. Keith Buckham. He's one of the co-organizers of this event and he's a consultant cardiothoracic surgeon at Aberdeen. He um, has done some of his training um, in, in Scotland, also in, in England, and his interests include anatomy and he's active in student teaching. And I think um, he's also, as Vipin alluded to, managed to spend time outside of cardiac surgery and his interests revolve around his faith and his family, which are two good interests to have, I think. So uh, I think Mr. Buckham's going to share something about his experience with trauma in, in cardiothoracic surgery. So Keith, over to you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to have 121 attendees. It's always a pleasure for us as consultants to interact with students. And one of the joys of cardiothoracic surgery is that it's almost always attached to a, a university medical school. And so I get a lot of pleasure out of uh, encouraging students. And we are always on the lookout for the next generation of people who want to follow in our specialty. So if you want to do that, please try and get in touch with a local cardiothoracic surgeon and see if you can do some work experience, some shadowing, uh, even do some little projects. Um, you know, it's quite, quite, quite a pleasure to be able to help students to get publications done and for those who are keen to pursue a career, that's something you can do as a medical student. So I wanted to, before I go on to my PowerPoint, just say a few things about relationships and how important they are in the progress of our career. Somehow or other, it's really important to um, find someone that's going to help you and uh, encourage you and you just have to be a bit brave with that and, and start emailing the consultants to see if any of them will meet up with you and you'll be surprised how, how willing they are so if you're in scotland well here here are the consultants that will help you on the screen if you're elsewhere then i'm sure that karen or farah would be happy to suggest people you might want to get in touch with so i'm going to start my talk off just by telling you a little bit about some of the people that helped me in my career in cardiothoracic surgery so we'll just get this up and running. Let's get this on. There we go. So this is a Mr. Ian Breckenridge. Uh, when I first started as a consultant in cardiothoracic surgery in Aberdeen, we get the odd patient that had had a, a valve replacement in Dundee back in the 1960s. And so Ian Breckenridge was one of the surgeons uh, in training in Dundee at that time. There is no cardiothoracic unit in Dundee any longer, sadly, but um, he was there at the outset of it for its short life. But when he moved south, the unit didn't last for long without him. Uh, Ian Breckenridge was a great trainer, and in the course of his career, he trained about 20 consultant cardiothoracic surgeons, including myself and Mr. Zamvar. But uh, he also pioneered uh, the training of a lot of uh, surgeons who, who came from all over the world. And two of them stayed in Cardiff and proved to be my best trainers. And uh, they are uh, Ahmed Azu on the left and Nihal Kulatilika on the right. Both of these men pioneered cardio cardiothoracic units in their own home countries. They didn't stay there for the rest of their lives, but they pioneered them. So uh, Ahmed pioneered one in Tripoli and Nihal pioneered one in Colombo in, in Sri Lanka. So they, without their help, I wouldn't have made it to being a consultant. They gave a lot of encouragement. The other group of people who were very influential in my training were my cohort of trainees. And uh, there we are, four of us. Uh, we had about maybe four years when we all were together in the same unit in Cardiff. And we shared each other's triumphs and failures. And uh, we spurred each other on, as the proverb says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the other. And without their uh, spurring effect, I would probably not have made it either. So it's been a great just pay tribute to them. We've met Mr. Zamvar already. This is Mr. Amer, who is from Southampton's consultant thoracic surgeon there, Mr. Zaidi, who is a colleague of Professor Batty's. So I'm going to talk to you about trauma this morning. Uh, a lot of the trauma that we see in the UK is 
a little bit mundane. It's rib fractures and sternal fractures, and that's what makes up the bread and butter of our trauma work in the UK, mainly coming about from falls or road traffic accidents. There's a small percentage of injuries, however, which are challenging to diagnose and treat, and these comprise injuries to the lungs, heart, aorta, and diaphragm. During my training, I was privileged to have the chance to do an exchange program in general and vascular surgery in Durban in South Africa. And I was were attached to a very large hospital, a 2000 bedded hospital, the second biggest hospital in South Africa. And the, 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 uh, the complexion of the trauma cases was quite different there in that about 95% of the cases belong to this last category here. So, and almost all of them were penetrating injuries. So it was an area where there was a lot of endemic violence and uh, it was a very busy hospital. We had six first on registrars on call for surgery every night and we had five operating theatres. And for vascular trauma, the catchment area was a population of 17 million. So we saw an awful lot of uh, trauma. So that's where my interest was sparked in the whole area. So we'll talk about the UK trauma scene as well. Uh, rib fractures are quite common. They're rarely fatal, except in patients who are very frail and elderly before the injury occurred. Operative intervention is sometimes undertaken for rib fractures nowadays, and that is a new development in the last five or 10 years. And this is done where there has been a change in the shape of the chest. That's called a thoracoplasty. When the chest has been changed in shape, usually, what this means is the chest has been crushed and uh, it used to be a, a thing that was carried out intentionally for patients with tuberculosis in the pre-antibiotic days but very rarely performed intentionally nowadays usually performed by uh, as a result of trauma sometimes rib fractures are associated with the need to ventilate a patient or in an, in an intensive care unit and we would then consider plating the ribs in order to make it easier to get them off the ventilator and sometimes if they have multiple rib fractures on both sides they can ease their pain pain control if we artificially uh, surgically plate the ribs put metal plates on so here's an example of a, a chest x-ray of a, a young lady who was in a car crash. This was a, a very tragic situation of five people being in a car and they drove right across the main dual carriageway from Dundee to Aberdeen. And uh, the three people in the back seat were not wearing seat belts. And the rear end of their car was struck by a bus traveling at 70 miles an hour. And it put the car into a spin. So the, car, the back seat of the car became like a centrifuge and all three passengers in the back were ejected through the rear window and the, the, the head injury that that involved killed them all outright. But the lady in the front was wearing a seat belt and she had this traumatic thoracoplasty. So by operating on this, we can restore the ribs into alignment and uh, give her a faster recovery and reduce the chances of her having long-term pain in the chest. Sternal fractures, there's not much to be said about them because they very rarely require any surgical treatment and it's really just a matter of admitting them to hospital and giving them painkillers and physiotherapy. Sometimes if the ribs are fractured at the front on either side of the sternum all the way down, it's usually an injury associated with over-enthusiastic cardiopulmonary resuscitation, then we may have to operate to fix such a sternum especially if that part of the chest wall exhibits paradoxical movement on respiration. That's something where normally every part of the chest, when you take a deep breath in, every part of the chest wall, including the sternum, moves outwards or forwards. But when there's a fracture, say, of a rib at the back and at the front, or of several ribs at the back and the front, then when the patient takes a deep breath in, that portion of the chest wall may move inwards instead of outwards. And this reduces the effectiveness of ventilation. And we call that paradoxical chest wall movement as a feature of chest trauma. We often see blood or air in the pleural cavity following rib fractures, and that's called hemothorax or pneumothorax, or it could be a hemoneumothorax if it's both. And we often have to put drains into the pleural cavity, and that's done with local anesthesia to allow the blood or the air to escape. 
Sometimes there's a leakage of air from the pleural cavity into the subcutaneous tissues and uh, that can give rise to a thing called subcutaneous emphysema when the skin swells up and when you touch it it feels like it has a crinkly sensation and uh, it's quite distinctive. This is one of, one of our specialty doctors is a bit artistic like Mr Zamvar and uh, he does nice drawings occasionally of the patients. So this, this is the sort of appearance that you get. You get this bubbliness in the skin and quite often if it involves the face the patient may not be able to open their eyes. And it's quite common that their voice will change to have a nasal quality to it. And uh, there are various things you can do to alleviate surgical emphysema. You can lie the patient head down so that the air towards the legs instead of towards the head. And you may also make small cuts above the clavicles or over the clavicles to manually squeeze the air out. Uh, it's, a, it's a very annoying thing but it is something we have to take seriously. And if too much surgical emphysema develops, then the gas may spread via the fascial planes into the mediastinum and cause problems with cardiac filling. And it can even cause cardiac arrest if it's severe. So when the patient cannot open their eyes is usually the sign that, that you have to start making those incisions on the clavicles and showing the nurses how to massage the patient to get the air out of the subcutaneous tissues. In, a, in the context of penetrating trauma, if someone comes with a hemothorax, then we, and indeed with blunt trauma as well, we, we would put a drain in and allow that blood to escape. And then from that point on, measure how much is coming each hour. And certainly if there was a liter in two hours uh, of fresh drainage, then this would indicate the need for opening the chest to deal with the problem. The, the, the patient uh, would need to be checked to make sure they're not on an anticoagulant of some sort. If they were, then we would give the antidote to the anticoagulant to try and reverse the, the, the bleeding tendency. In the worst case scenario, you have to take the lung out if there's uncontrollable hemorrhage from the lung and uh, that may require a clamp to be placed across the hilum of the lung to get control. And that has to be the large bare metal clamp, but that's a technical point. Diaphragmatic injury can be blunt or penetrating and it can present late. Uh, when it presents late it may require a, an approach through the chest but in the acute phase it's usually best repaired intra-abdominally. Uh, it gives the chance for the surgeon to inspect the abdominal organs as well in case there's any injury there. This is an example of a, a chest x-ray, it's rather an old one, but you can see that the colon has migrated up into the chest. This was actually a gunshot wound and uh, the patient presented some a few years later uh, with this x-ray. Um, you don't have to do anything about this if it's not really compromising the lung too much. If the whole chest had been full of intestinal contents, then there would be an argument for repairing it to, to improve lung function. But um, in the chronic context, we often just leave these uh, hernias alone. They may obstruct, in which case you'd have to operate, and they may obstruct decades after the original injury. Spinal injuries can be associated with chest trauma, and we may have paraplegia, which means that the patient is paralyzed from the waist down. And the spinal cord finishes about the L2, L1, L2 level. So throughout the thoracic region, the spinal cord is present in the spinal canal. And we occasionally will have patients who have an unstable spinal fracture and that may, may have to be put in traction uh, to avoid or help prevent further progression of a spinal injury. In the context of gunshot wounds, especially high velocity gunshot wounds, you get a thing called proximity injury, which is due to ultrasonic waves being set up by the bullet going through the patient, and it leads to necrosis of tissues in a certain cylindrical formation uh, centered on the path of the bullet. And this can sometimes cause the damage to just half of the spinal cord. And we call that brown saccard syndrome when it happens. The bullet need not have gone through the spine or the spinal cord. It may have passed paraspinally and uh, we get this problem with dissociated uh, neurological signs. So this is because the, the, the nerves coming from the brain to the skeletal muscles travel in the lateral part of the, 
the spinal cord so that uh, if this, this part of the, the um, spinal cord is damaged, they may have uh, loss of the power on, on that side and loss of sensation on the other side of the body below the level of the injury. Aortic injuries are quite unusual. They can be blunt or penetrating. In the UK context, they are usually blunt from a major road traffic accident. Uh, the, the, the descending thoracic aorta is firmly bonded onto the spinal column by the intercostal arteries, but the aortic arch lies quite free within the mediastinum and it can, it's got a certain amount of mobility in it. So when there's a deceleration injury, the aortic arch may be torn off the descending thoracic aorta. It's an injury that's often fatal when it happens, but the tear of the aorta may only be partial, in which case the patient may survive. Penetrating injury to the aortic arch is, or to the descending thoracic aorta, I believe is fatal in the vast majority of cases at the scene of the injury, but occasionally we get patients who survive to, to the hospital and we have to operate on them. So this is the sort of picture you get in a blunt trauma. So this is called the aortic isthmus. It's the junction between the aortic arch and the descending thoracic aorta. And uh, when there is a, a big hematoma in this area, it may compress the trachea and the carina and cause airway difficulties. The blood in the, in, in the mediastinal tissues may also track upwards into the neck and cause difficulty with breathing at that level. So here is an example. Normally the space between the back of the throat and the front of the spine is a few millimeters, but here the patient's got a ruptured aorta and the hematoma is tracked up into the neck, causing what we call aerodigestive tract compression. When the, the, the aortic arch and its main branches are surrounded by large veins, this is the left innominate vein, this is the right innominate vein, this is the superior vena cava. So in the context of penetrating injuries, about half of these penetrating injuries to these vessels will be associated with a major aortovenous fistula. And uh, here we have an example of that on the arteriogram. These patients may have high output cardiac failure to compound their hemodynamic instability. And these are other examples of stabbed aortic arch here with a large false aneurysm. This is not the heart, this is the false aneurysm coming from the, the aortic arch. And uh, this is an example of a penetrating injury of the innominate artery and it shows a, a bilobed false aneurysm. So the, 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 the bullet has gone through the innominate artery and caused a, a false aneurysm on either side. Lung trauma can be blunt or penetrating, and the approach depends on the stability of the patient. We, we would have to have uh, these earlier indications for operating of massive blood loss. And we, 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 if, if it's an overwhelming uh, blood loss and we believe there might be a, a major hilar vascular injury, it's best to approach it through a sternotomy and to get control of the vessels intrapericardially. Uh, otherwise, it can be approached by thoracotomy. And where there's been a gunshot wound to the lung, it's, it's quite safe to sacrifice up to 50% of the segmental arteries to a lobe. The lobe will still work quite well. With cardiac trauma, uh, it's usually penetrating. Uh, it is theoretically a risk in all cases of sternal fracture, but it's very rare for there actually to be um, a rupture of the heart. With penetrating injury to the heart, we have, we often talk about the golden hour in trauma management, but in the penetrating cardiac situation, we're talking about golden five minutes to make our decisions. So we don't have a lot of time and we have to suspect cardiac injury and any penetrating injury that involves the precordium. That's the name we give to the front of the chest, the bit that lies in front of the heart, and is generally taken to be the mid clavicular line right down to the uh, costal margin and then horizontally across, including the upper abdomen. We look for a classical triad of clinical signs, which are low blood pressure, fast heart rate, and raised JVP. So it's appropriate to try and get a central line into these patients. And I normally would put a subclavian line in and run some saline through it. 
and then while the saline is running, take some scissors and cut the tubing and hold it in the air and just visually assess the height of the CVP and that will show you if the patient has got a high CVP. That's the rough and ready way of uh, ascertaining the CVP. And if all three signs are present, the next step is to go straight to theater and get the chest open. Here's an example of a penetrating cardiac trauma that we had in Aberdeen a few years ago. It was a, a, a group of students who'd been drinking all night and one of them was wearing a t-shirt that had a target on the front and he was boasting that he had a bulletproof t-shirt and uh, one of the flatmates actually had an air rifle in his flat and uh, they decided to do a mock execution to see if the the t-shirt was bulletproof and uh, after they pulled the trigger he fell to the ground and appeared to be dead and uh, they said that it sobered them up very quickly uh, but then he came round and uh, stood up and he had blood on his t-shirt and he said I I'm feeling fine I'll, I'll just go home but to their credit uh, the other students phoned an ambulance and, and also phoned the police to confess to what they had done so here on the x-ray you can see the little air gun pellet in the overlying the heart shadow. I don't know if you've seen films, underwater films of people diving into water or uh, penguins diving into water and when you dive into water you entrain air and it's the same with a bullet, it entrains air. So we can see that it's air in the heart on the admission CT scan. So that tells us that the bullet actually went into the heart. So we had to take him to theatre and operate and sew up the hole in the front of the right ventricle and retrieve the pellet. And the story had a happy ending because he didn't press charges and uh, I think the, the culprit was given a warning and released. I would like just to mention in passing that we sometimes see blowout lesions of heart valves in blunt trauma. So if you imagine a brown paper bag that you blow up and then pop it with your hand, uh, that's how the heart valves can be disrupted in trauma. So this was a, a patient who was in a car crash and uh, when he came to us, he had, in addition to his chest blunt injuries, he had a severe aortic regurgitation going on with pulmonary edema. And the CT scan showed this curious sort of, um, looked a slightly reminiscent of an aortic dissection just above the aortic valve. And we had to operate on him and he had a, a blowout injury of his aortic valve. So we, we replaced that aortic valve and he did very well. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. This is a picture of Aberdeen Harbour and it's a pleasure to be serving the people in this area and living in Aberdeen. It's a great place. That was really fantastic. Thank you so much for a really engaging talk. There's a couple of questions that have come through if you don't mind on the Q&A. Go ahead. Hey, super. So um, you spoke a lot about camaraderie and training um, and I just want to know what influenced your decision uh, to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? I always tell junior doctors and medical students that uh, what you end up doing in life is a combination of your inclination and your opportunity. So you might be inclined to be a cardiac surgeon, but you should set goalposts on your ambition. And if you haven't reached your goalposts by a certain time, it's a good idea to change direction. Um, I did a bit of medicine before doing surgery. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished medical school. I enjoyed it all. So I did two years of general medicine then I did four years of general surgery. And uh, it was particularly during my uh, th the encounters I had with thoracic trauma. And indeed, with I did a six month attachment in thoracic surgery in Hermars Hospital. And it kind of linked in with my medical background as well that cardiothoracic surgeons take all their referrals, almost all of them, from physicians. So it's quite good to have a, a familiarity with their workplace. I'd done some time in cardiology and respiratory medicine. I used to do my own bronchoscopy lists as a physician at one time. So it was nice to uh, just, uh, it's nice to work with your hands, I think, and surgery gives you that extra skill, uh, which takes a long time to acquire. Does that answer the question? Super.
Yeah, it does indeed. And we just wanted to know what happened to those culprit students. Do we know where they ended up in their career with the Ergon incident? Do oh, you have any follow-up information? I want to emphasise they were not medical students. Uh, so uh, let me say that first of all, because when medical students do things like this, you get a letter through the post from the General Medical Council to invite you to a, a professional misconduct hearing. And uh, so you, you have to be very careful not to do anything crazy when you're a medical student. <laughs> Super response. Okay, so then uh, James wanted to know about paradoxical chest movement. Um, I think in regard to flail chest, he wanted to know what the impact that has on the patient's breathing. Yeah, well, it does. It has, a, it has a big impact on the patient's breathing, especially if they've got it, it, not normal lung function to start with. If you were living in... Um, in a remote part of Pakistan, then what they would do for this is that they would um, uh, put some wires around the ribs and, and uh, get you to lie on your side and they would put a pulley above you with weights and uh, that would uh, counterbalance the paradoxical motion and restore normal mechanics to breathing. So there are old fashioned ways of fixing, fixing the paradoxical segment. But nowadays we like to put these rib plates on. Yeah, I know it was a really great example. So one of the other questions was you spoke about quite high pressured environments with some of the scenarios that you gave. Uh, and Tamsin just wants to know, have you got any tips for staying calm under pressure? The, the main thing is to actually experience lots and lots of uh, episodes of stress and strain and uh, what doesn't kill you strengthens you. And uh, you, you, you do have to be non-volatile. If you're a volatile personality, you will not succeed in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, you've got to learn to find a way of, um, of uh, what they used to call, what Norman Shumway called, radical, exhibiting radical patients. And the students want to know, is there any tips for how you can get such brilliant experience that you've got and like for trauma and in operating theatres like during summer holidays? Well, you can go and do electives. You could go and do an elective in Peshawar in Pakistan, if you like. Uh, you could take your life in your hands. Uh, you'll get fantastic trauma experience. We had a couple of surgeons over attached with me, actually. They both uh, came through British Council and uh, they were from Peshawar. And this, uh, there's a lot of trauma experience to be had there. One of them came actually to, we sent, we went down to Edinburgh for a couple of weeks and I, may, I said to him, make sure you give your talk on trauma to the Edinburgh surgeons. They were actually the two surgeons who were on duty when this uh, young lady, Malala, was shot. And uh, they were the two surgeons who operated on her and saved her life. So uh, it's funny that they should come to Aberdeen, of all places. Fantastic. That was all the questions that came through in the q and I'll hand back to you, Farah. And thanks very much. And you've heard it all here. Um, you've heard Mr. Buchan quote a Kelly Clarkson song. So you're just showing that he is actually hip. So what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So thanks, um, Keith. I think that we're doing really well for time. And um, two fascinating talks from different um, angles of cardio, the specialty of cardiothoracic surgery.